From the station working for you, this is WRTV News at Noon, streaming now. Welcome to the News at Noon. I'm Rafael Sanchez in for Lauren Casey. We got spoiled last week after those nice warm temperatures, but this week a coat <laughs> may not be optional. Meteorologist Todd Clausen standing by with your weather outlook. Hey, Todd. Yeah, you know, we were in the 60s at the end of last week and into Saturday, Raphael, and here we are today talking about wind chills in the teens and actual temperatures that are still sitting in the 20s at this noon hour with lots of clouds around. We're at 29 in Indy, 28 in Columbus, a little warmer in Lafayette, if you want to call it that, at 33, but there's a pretty good wind out of the northwest, and that's doing two things for us. It's keeping our wind chill values in the teens and 20s at this noon hour, but it's also preventing us from warming a much here throughout the day today. Now the one thing that will change is I do expect some sunshine to work in as the afternoon progresses and you can see off to our west in Illinois uh, we see the skies already starting to clear. It's a slow process from west to east here throughout the afternoon hours but we should work some sunshine in. The sunshine though while it'll brighten the sky obviously not going to help us much in the temperature department until that storm system off to our east continues to head in that direction. So it's a brighter afternoon it's just not a warmer afternoon as temperatures will only go up a couple degrees from where they are right now to about 33 Raphael for your afternoon high. A bundle up. Thank you, Todd. New this midday, investigators have released the name of a woman found dead near a boat ramp in Morgan County. The sheriff's office says the victim is 28 year old Meredith Ellen Miller of Morgantown. Sheriff Rich Meyer says her body was found this past Friday at 1.30 in the morning near the Henderson Ford boat ramp that's in Martinsville. The sheriff says he hopes that to hear from anyone who was near or around Miller before her death. If you have any information, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers. That number is on your screen, 317-262-TIPS. Also new today, a member of the City County Council in Indianapolis and his wife are both now recovering from COVID-19. Duke Oliver represents the 9th District right here in Indianapolis. The city says that he and his wife Dorothy, they tested positive earlier this month. The Olivers are both in their 70s. Dorothy Oliver was briefly in the hospital, but the city says she and the counselor are now both recovering at home. This noon, we're learning that vaccinations will begin Wednesday at IU Health Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis. It's among the first five hospitals in Indiana to get doses of the Pfizer vaccine. As ABC's Rena Roy reports, doctors and nurses at a Queens, New York hospital are receiving the shot today. Today, a pivotal moment in the fight against COVID-19. A critical care nurse at this hospital in Queens, New York, among some of the first in the country to get the Pfizer vaccine. Well, I feel hopeful today, um, relieved. Across New York, Northwell Health setting up nine centers to begin vaccinating its 56,000 frontline workers as early as this afternoon. 2.9 million doses will be making their way to every corner of the country in ultra-cold freezers on planes and in trucks via FedEx and UPS. After the FDA authorized the vaccine for emergency use over the weekend, healthcare workers, seniors, and first responders will be given first priority. We could have every nursing home patient vaccinated in the United States by Christmas. 145 locations are set to receive those vital vials today. In Chicago, Rush University Hospital transforming its lobby into mass vaccination bays. Allison Wines has been fighting the virus on the front lines for months at the University of Iowa Hospital and is set to receive her vaccine today, hoping this will be a true turning point nine months into this pandemic. I'm going to go treat some COVID patients and see um, a handful of them in the morning. Then I'll take a little break when it's my assigned time, get my COVID shot and go right back to my COVID patients. Research shows the vaccine is 95% effective. This crucial moment here, not a moment too soon. A record more than 108,000 Americans are currently hospitalized with COVID-19. And with months to go until most Americans can get vaccinated, authorities are urging people not to let their guard down. Officials say one of the biggest challenges moving forward will be getting Americans to trust the vaccine. But an encouraging new ABC News Ipsos poll shows more than 80% of people say they do, in fact, want to get vaccinated. In Queens, New York, Rena Roy, ABC News. Now let me take you to the west side of Indianapolis. This behind me is the FedEx hub 
in Indianapolis at the International Airport. It is playing a key role in vaccine storage as well as distribution. The FedEx facility is responsible for storing vaccines in freezers and making sure that they get to their destinations. It may be our finest hour, um, and I, I'm just so deeply proud of the role our team members have played in the fight against this pandemic to date. These vaccine manufacturers and the distributors, they're already our customers. We know them, we know their business. So the government came to us because they know we have the expertise in this. They know we have the network and the capabilities and the know-how to do it. In the first round, Indiana expects to receive more than 55,000 doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. In Democracy 2020, the next step in making official the presidential win of Joe Biden is now underway. The ballots cast for the President of the United States have been tested. All 11 votes have been cast for Donald J. Trump. This morning, Indiana's 11 electors, they met at the State House in downtown Indianapolis. They voted for President Trump since he won the state in the November election. Other electors from across the country will also vote today for the candidate that won their state or their congressional district. President-elect Joe Biden won the largest share of electoral votes to win the presidency and received the most popular votes ever. He's expected to address the nation later this evening. On January the 6th, the votes from the electors are certified in a congressional ceremony in which Vice President Mike Pence is required by law to preside over that key moment. So, have you mailed that Christmas gift yet to that loved one? If not, listen, you better hurry up. Up next, the deadlines you're up against if you want that special someone to get their present before Christmas. Todd, don't worry, your present is in the mail. <laughs> All right. If you want to get it there quicker, though, just leave it on my desk there in the studio, <laughs> Raphael. I'll get it Christmas week. All right. It's going to be an active week of weather uh, across the country with the exception of just one day here in Indianapolis. You notice that one big storm passing off to our east right now, but another one heads our way. That along with the winter chill is settling in. We'll talk all about it coming up in your WRTV Storm Team forecast when the news at noon continues right here on WRTV. It's hard to believe, but we're just 10 days from Christmas Eve and key deadlines are now fast approaching. The Postal Service says this is their busiest week of the year. Heads up if you're using regular mail to send your holiday gift. You must get that in the mail by this Friday, December the 18th, if you want it to arrive by Christmas Day. Now, starting December the 19th, the Postal Service recommends you use priority mail to make sure that your packages arrive on time. With a record number of people shopping online this year, the Postal Service will begin Sunday delivery this upcoming weekend. So it looks different because of the pandemic, but holiday wishes are still coming true thanks to an organization which has been granting them for more than a century. Today was the first of four distribution days for the Salvation Army's Angel Tree program right here in central Indiana. Members of the Salvation Army and dozens of volunteers were following stricter health protocols in putting together the gifts that will make the holidays a little brighter for many Hoosier children. It's really about providing hope to let families know that they're not alone, that other people care about them and uh, are willing to do something about that. So it's really about touching people's lives because the gifts, the children don't know the gifts are coming from the Salvation Army, only the parents know that. And so the children are receiving that special feeling that you get when you open up your, your gifts on Christmas. A big thank you to the Salvation Army and to all of their volunteers. This year, the Angel Tree Program is providing toys for more than 5,000 Who's your children? The Salvation Army also uses the program to fill other family needs, such as diapers, winter clothing, and shoes. It was an injury that changed the course of music history. Did you know this? Next, a look back at the life of a legend and how his initial plan was to be a hero on the diamond. Today, you may consider it a hit or a foul, depending on your weather preference. It's a chilly start to the week, but will it get warmer or stay as is? Todd Clawson knows the answer. He's coming right up after the news at noon right here on WRTV. You've got to kiss an angel good morning and let her know you think about her when you're gone. The tributes to the late Charlie Pride focus on how he broke the color barrier in country music, and they should. But did you know the only reason that may have happened was because a long, long time ago, Charlie hurt his arm. 
He was born in Sledge, Mississippi, south of Memphis. And Charlie was among the millions who watched another pioneer make history. When I saw Jackie Robinson go to the major league, and I said, I was picking the cotton beside my dad, I said, listen, I said, Dad, I said, here's my way out of the cotton field, you know. Charlie grew up to be a hard-throwing right-hander who could switch hit for good measure. When he was 18, he ended up playing for the Memphis Red Sox of the Negro American League. He then got what he thought was his big break in 1953 with the Bronx Bombers themselves. I signed with the New York Yankees uh, organization. My mother did, rather, and sent me to uh, Rio Vista, California. And after that, they sent me to um, Boise, Idaho. Boise, however, was where Charlie Pride's fastball lost its pop. Charlie hurt his pitching elbow and he never really recovered. And all of a sudden in Idaho, the right-hander was giving up a whole lot of taters. Charlie didn't give up though. Back with the Memphis Red Sox, he started throwing a knuckleball. He had some success. He ended up back in the predominantly white minor leagues, but he later got traded to the Birmingham Black Barons for a used bus. He then had one last shot at the bigs, a spring training invitation. We were at the Los Angeles Angels in uh, 61. But I didn't get a chance to stay with them. They sent me home with a tuna fish sandwich and orange. <laughs> but Charlie wasn't quite ready to give up baseball just yet. He went all the way out to Montana. He got a job at the American Smelting and Refining Company just so he could play on the company baseball team, the East Helena Smelterites. By this time, Charlie was also singing on the side. One night, he sang during the intermission of a show headlined by country music stars Red Sovine and Red Foley. The Reds were blown away by Charlie's voice. Red Sovine says he told Pride, I don't care what color you are, you should go to Nashville. A year later, Charlie Pride did just that, and he made history. It's history that sadly ended just one month after his last known performance here on WRTV at the CMA Awards. Ray Steele, WRTV. Thank you, so much. thank you, Mr. Charlie. Ray, thank you so much for that. He was an icon and the world was made much better with his music. And of course, one of our biggest country music fans is right here in the other box in the basement, meteorologist Todd Clausen. Hey, Todd. Yeah, Raphael, Charlie Pride, obviously, Ray did a great job there telling his life story. One of the best uh, there ever was and broke a lot of barriers. All right, outside right now, we are dealing with just lots of clouds around and a winter chill that's really settled into the area. Temperatures right now are sitting in the 20s and 30s, depending on where you uh, live. We actually hit our high shortly after midnight this morning, and we've been falling ever since. And our temperatures are just not really going to warm a whole lot as we go throughout the course of uh, the day day today. 29 right now in Indy, 27 in Bloomington. And to make matters worse, there's a breeze out there and that's making it feel like it's in the teens still in some locations, including Indianapolis, where the wind chill value is at 19 degrees. 18 is what it feels like over in Richmond. Where are our high temperatures going? Well, even as we work some sunshine in here throughout the afternoon hours, we're not going to see these temperatures warm a whole lot. Only back up to right around 33 in most locations down in the south, maybe a couple degrees warm. Uh, but all these temperatures are still below where they should be this time of year. Our actual high temperature should be getting up to right around 39. You do notice as you look off uh, to the west here, the clearing skies in Illinois. And that should continue from west to east across Indiana this afternoon. It'll be a slow and gradual process. Uh, but eventually we should start to work more in the way of sunshine into the area. Some lake effect snows in Michigan. There could be a flurry in northern locations drifting in off the lake here today. But nothing of consequence. Uh, but but the overall weather pattern is going to remain fairly active across a good chunk of the country and another storm system will be heading our way this evening it's quiet though 521 is sunset once the sun sets clear skies temperatures into the 20s tomorrow morning's a very cold start we wake up to about 22 in peru 24 in indianapolis and then throughout the day tomorrow it's the opposite of today we start off with some sunshine and then the clouds will thicken throughout the day tomorrow but temperatures will only be again right around freezing for your afternoon highs. Let me jump to Wednesday morning. This is 3.30 in the morning on TrueCast. You see that timestamp on the right uh, top portion of your screen. 
We'll look for some snow showers to develop throughout the morning hours. The bulk of the heaviest of the precipitation is going to stay off to our east. We're on the western fringe of this system, and that means not a lot in the way of snow for us, but there will be the potential Wednesday uh, for some accumulating snow across the area. It will develop throughout the morning hours on Wednesday. At this point, it looks to be more so after the morning drive. The accumulation looks to be pretty light. The main impact would be some slick spots. The best chance of seeing uh, some accumulation is going to be south and east of Indianapolis, where we could see up to an inch, maybe a little bit more in far southern locations. But you notice as you work your way to the north, the numbers will drop off very, very quickly with less than a half an inch. And by the time you get to places like Logansport, into Lafayette, and even into the Peru area, probably maybe a dusting and a few snow showers, and that is just about it. Of course, we'll keep an eye on it. Plenty of time to fine-tune that forecast. We'll let you know if the track changes. But at this point, it does not look like a big snowmaker for us. Quiet for Thursday and Friday, and then as we get into Saturday, some rain and or snow showers a possibility. Eventually going over to all rain showers, though, as you see the temperatures eventually climb up into the mid-40s. The mornings, though, Raphael, they are going to be really chilly. Every morning this week, at least for the next seven days, are going to either be at or below freezing, with many of those mornings down into the 20s. Stay in the basement. I'll stay in my living room. We'll be okay socially distanced. Thank you, Todd, very much. As we take a live look outside, we're going to tell you the story about a Christmas tree that became a magnet for something really unexpected. That story coming up right here on WRTV. A Christmas tree inside your home can be tempting for children and for pets to explore. A woman in Florida was awakened last week thinking she needed to retrieve a pet from her tree. But as Scripps reporter Megan McRoberts tells us, she was in, ah, for a rude awakening. During the holidays, there's just one late night guest you welcome into your home. There's a cat inside my Christmas tree. But an unexpected intruder prompting Aubrey Yacobelli's early morning wake up call this week. I have a doggy door and my dog sleeps right in front of that dog door. But she heard her dog growling suspiciously and found something else made it through that dog door. There's some furry body inside the Christmas tree. I decide to grab a frying pan of all things and poke at it, try to get it out. After minutes of poking and prodding, what is that? Is that a squirrel? No. I didn't, I didn't want to hurt the animal. I just wanted it outside the house. Oh, it's a raccoon. This is bad. Things escalate quickly as the raccoon makes its move. <laughs> yeah. I, when you look back at the video, I wish I could have done it a different way. You don't know what, I don't know what was going through my head. The raccoon finds a safe space in the dining room. The raccoon ran away from freedom, jumped on my chandelier where he swung there for like 30 minutes. These are all the ornaments that made it. There's my beautiful tree. There's the raccoon. There's the dog. It took nearly an hour to free the critter, and now Yacobelli takes it all in in hindsight. I should have called animal control. I should have called someone. So <laughs> you can't make fun of me more than I can make fun of myself. Sharing this laugh at her own expense. Frying pans aren't good weapons. To spread some cheer for a fitting end to a year where it seems anything could happen. Just laugh at yourself because that's all you can do at this point. That's all you can do at this point. Wow, I would do the same thing, Todd. I'd have my broom. I, I don't know who, I, I'd probably call you to come on over and uh, get the critter out of my tree, but uh, we'll see what happens. Hopefully that won't happen, hey, You just call me. Uh, yeah, you just call me, Rafi. I'll be, I'll be down there. I'll, I'll, find some stuff, I'll find some stuff to wear for you. We'll, 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 get, we'll get rid of any critter you have down there in Franklin. All right, outside right now, it is cold. It's cloudy. I'm expecting more in the way of sunshine here this afternoon, but temperatures won't really warm a whole lot. Tomorrow, 35 as well with partly sunny skies. Wednesday, we bring some snow into the area. At this point, it does not look like a big snowmaker for us, but some southern and eastern locations could once again be in that one to maybe two inch range with numbers dropping off dramatically as you work your way to the north. In fact, Lafayette to Peru, probably hardly any snow, but something we'll keep an eye on and then quiet weather for Thursday and Friday, Rafael. Uh, Todd, thank you so much and thank you for making WRTV your choice for news. We'll see you this afternoon, beginning of the news at five. Have a great afternoon.